Okay. It should be recording now. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, first, um, I mean, probably most of you know, I, we've tried to organize, I guess, a bi-weekly call just so that, and that's bi-weekly and twice per week, um, not once every other week, just so like people, uh, could share, could share, uh, you know, what their teams are doing in particular for team leads, but really, um, anyone can, uh, you know, present an update, um, if we have time, um, and if, you know, the team lead isn't present. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, first, I guess, just go around, I think, in terms of team leads, um, well, we have Alexi from, uh, um, what was, what was your team again? <laughs> Sorry. Immunology. Oh, oh yeah, Im- Im- immunology. Um, Why don't you give a quick update on what you've been up to and how your team's making progress? Uh, I think maybe we could start with a description of our projects in general, because, frankly, (laughs) uh, I have no idea what is uh, going around me, what projects are are, are around so, um, first, uh, f- for, for the start, I think we should just uh, say a few words about our project. Um, uh, Immunology Knowledge Graph is uh, a project about building a uh, knowledge graph from Code 19 dataset. We want to extract information about uh, proteins, genes, cells, and their relations. And then uh, we would like to build uh, prediction models on top of these uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, similar approaches uh, already exist. They based on omics data, on data that uh, uh, that um, omics labs produced uh, with uh, very expensive experiments. So the main idea to uh, make this uh, data more cheaper, more accessible, and uh, yeah, and create. Uh, more powerful prediction uh, models. We started uh, with uh, existing knowledge graph that uh, was uh, produced by Fraunhofer Institute, but we faced with uh, several issues with uh, this graph. And now we have a collaboration with uh, Fraunhofer Institute uh, we are working on update of this knowledge graph to get the gold standard, standard for training our model. So this is uh, our first direction now. The second direction is uh, building uh, the model for information extraction uh, itself. Uh, we re- realized that uh, existing approaches uh, do not work well for a uh, biomedical domain, for, the, for example, uh, named entity recognition and entity leaking. I thought uh, that uh, named entity recognition is a uh, well-studied task. But uh, in biomedical domains, there are many issues about uh, entity leaking, entity typing, etc. Uh, and now we are uh, working on end to end approaches. We want to, uh, we want to try to uh, implement ontology to the model itself to solve issues with entity linking, to, to, to link uh, entities with uh, 
uh, ontology terms. So this is uh, the second uh, second direction that we are working uh, on uh, now. We have uh, uh, the base model that was described in one of the papers, and we're trying to reproduce results of this uh, paper now. We built a toy uh, data set from uh, Indra model, from Indra statements to uh, to, uh, to try to train this model while we are working with uh, Frank Wolfram Institute on, uh, on uh, new uh, training data on new knowledge graph. Yeah, so this is the uh, second direction and uh, third direction that is leading by uh, Charlie. Uh, he is working on clone graph embeddings. It should be a base for prediction models for the future research. So this is the short summary, I guess, <laughs> for our project. Okay, cool. Um, how many active team members would you say you have right now? Uh, we have uh, four or five active people for now. We have uh, Svetlana, she is working on a uh, model. We have Elana and uh, Fatma, they are working on toy data set. Uh, we have Charlie, he is working on uh, clone graph embeddings. Yeah, and, and we have, uh, of course, uh, advisors from Indra, Ben, John. We have Jeremy. He is a, a system uh, biologist. So we can get advices from him. Okay, that sounds uh, interesting. Um, do you have everything you need in terms of resources or compute power? Um, we we need a, a annotation to, tool for work with Frankhofer Institute. Uh, I set up. Uh, Sorry, this is my dog. Wait a minute. Sorry. Um, yeah, we need annotation tool. Um, I uh, set up a tool named uh, Inception, but uh, on, on my server, on my Google Cloud platform. But I have uh, several issues with uh, this tool. It would be great if somebody with DevOps skills uh, helped me uh, with this uh, tool. Uh, this is first task and the second task. Um, I would like to uh, um, to add ontologies to this tool, to integrate ontologies that we use for entity uh, linking to uh, uh, to this tool. And uh, we need to uh, set up a Sparkle endpoints for uh, each uh, for each ontology. I guess uh, about. 10 ontologies. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds uh, really interesting. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, thanks for the update. Uh, if you want to do, like, a more formal demo on one of these other things, let me, or I, Malavika, I know. Um, I think she's the one also running things. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Um, I guess, Anton, you kind of represent team data sets and infrastructure, or I don't know if it has a specific name, but do you want to talk about stuff? Yeah, sure. So we've got a lot of updates in the background since like, I last had the chance to, to present about it. Um, so if you, if you follow our GitHub repo, so COVID infrastructure, we already, like, for example, if you run, uh, if you want to run the same infrastructure we use on our cloud, uh, you can like set it up on your own server or machine. Everything is through Docker Compose, etc. It's still a little bit like a mess if you want specific things to be implemented fully, like let them encrypt HTTPS, etc. So just pin me on Slack and I'll help you navigate. Um, so again, it's so in a sense this initiative in the state of people who know what they're doing could just go and take the pieces and play with them. If you're just like learning this type of stuff, then you will probably need some help and guidance. But again, we're open to, to help. Uh, so this, this is point one. Uh, point two, uh, right now we're in the transition of using more of AWS services. So people who are with AWS experience are welcome to help us out a little bit because before we were mainly focused on GCP, but right now we got donated some server credits from Amazon. And this the, the first batch of credit comes specifically from AWS. And now we kind of like, okay, this is where we need to run credits more. So if, if you currently use any of our collab instances, they're mostly run on AWS at the moment. Just, just FYI. Uh, so we're so we're in a good position currently in terms of how our community utilizes server credits. If before, like about two weeks, three weeks ago, I personally started to get you know, like really worried that we have maybe like one month left of burn rate, etc. Now I'm kind of like, oh, okay, we probably have another three months easily, even if we run up of our computational stuff. So we're in a good server financial situation at the moment. Uh, regarding data sets, et cetera, again, our dataverse, it's constantly get filled up with some data sets. And in fact, uh, Slava created a notebook example of how to pull like a metadata file about all of the data currently in Dataverse. So uh, just I'm just calling out like people who want to, to play with it. So in a sense, it just kind of like whatever data we have in our Dataverse. Again, that metadata, it doesn't cover everything because some of the data that are still going through curation pipeline to be added like publicly, right? Because what we do with scrape GitHub repos for anything related to COVID-19. And then we just simply probe files. Can we import them into Pandas or not? Or not Pandas, like any form of like data frame, for example, Pandas data frame. And if it is, we pull it into our Dataverse for like essentially archiving all of that. And then we have a data curation team. They kind of reach out to uh, like the original authors. So they're outside of Corona Y. And some of those authors kind of pin us back and tell us like, oh, you know what? You guys miss this part of the meta description of that data set or something, or this is a kind of good scenario. Then we have kind of, oh, we have a really good data set. It goes into our public, uh, like public state on our dataverse. And if it's sometimes people reach out to us and, and ask us to remove the, the data set because they think it's you know not good quality or something, or maybe there are some other reasons, and then we never assign a published, so we, we remove it from our database. So again, datasets.coronawide.org, where the data are stored. Um, yeah, that's kind of the main big big things that are currently at the moment. Um, I could speak quickly about some other initiatives I know that are happening currently, but I don't see people on like on, on today's call uh, I know there is like this team that uh, start, like uh, does performs research on historical data so like Spanish flu project or 
I think the team is called Team Social Analysis. So they do some interesting stuff. Uh, I, I can't go specifically into details, but I'm seeing the the servers are running, crunching some numbers, so something happens there. It's a good thing. <laughs> um, then um, I know we have people here and there. It's like we kind of have like this uh, fluid team that does like works in shadows, connects like different pipelines or different data sets. And I see Pranjali on the call. He could probably tell a few things what what he was doing because I know he was working on uh, pipelines of connecting our Mongo database with Elasticsearch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Pranjali, are you do you want to tell something or? I don't know, like sometimes I know Pranjala has trouble with microphone. <laughs> but anyway, so we have a lot of activity on, on the background. Still looking for a good format, how to like streamline it, maybe just again, how to, like we're looking for ideas, how to um, kind of demonstrate what people are doing. Because one thing when it's like this vertical team, like Alex Ages did a good kind of presentation. Okay, here's what we do. Here is our goal. Here are people, you know, that are involved on uh, our like this horizontal initiatives, DevOps or kind of like this maintenance type of stuff. It's it's hard to present, right? Because it's like, what you actually do? Well, last week it was all about, you know, one thing. This week it's about other thing, etc. So it's hard to kind of do this demo, right? The only thing we can do is just, oh, here is like we we'll launch Dataverse, but it, again, it's old news right now. It's all about kind of making sure it, 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 it filled with the right data sets. Um, we have a lot of different projects and services that we're right now experimenting to launch. One of them is for a team, uh, essentially like to, sh to, to have a baseline for team literature review tool, which will be kind of like this cutting edge. We're building this hello product, etc. but we already playing with viewfind, which is kind of analogous to what PubMed searches. So it's again, a robust system that you can query your like library of, of, of papers. And we already uh, kind of used the name entity recognition and all of those like different things in filters for that system. And it looks very promising. And uh, like, again, I think I mean, it will take some time for us just to, to make sure we pipe all of the things that our teams did into that viewfind thing. But we'll have really, really like I'm I'm super excited by having this very strong kind of like search engine that is at this stage it will be kind of yet another tab in the browser of searchers to search through. And I I know that people we spoke with not really fond of it. But as a baseline, I think it will be like really, really great demo of of the results that uh, our teams are doing. And then on top of it, we'll be able to work with this team literature review stuff. So we're kind of like uh, getting ready for, for that, just to kind of like this. Uh, good informational space to, to present uh, what we have launched on, on the server side. Yeah, that's pretty much it for now. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. If, if I may. Uh, first question about search engine. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to try uh, to use search engine uh, to filter uh, papers for, for, for our purpose for Immunology, mm -hmm. technology graph, for example, because now we have uh, papers that was uh, that were uh, chosen by uh, Frankhofer team manually, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for the future, uh, in general, of course, we would like to automate this part too. We would like to uh, to be able to choose to filter. Uh, papers uh, with uh, uh, with search engine. 
it, so, yeah, it, 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 uh, it uh, uh, would be very interesting to compare results of uh, search engine and uh, uh, Frankfurt team. So definitely is. And here again, we had like this team search engine, uh, like task force for a while now. Um, in a sense, we have on the server side of things. So we have like elastic search with, and if you can create an index, you can, I mean, like the question is at the end of the day, well, it comes to like, okay, what do you want to search? Right. And what type of index can you build? So now, for example, elastic search as a backend could be used there. Or if you, if, for example, what I just mentioned, you find like this instance, it's, it's, that engine is mostly kind of more of a, like a product on the front end side of things. It takes Mark 21 format for, for literature. So you convert whatever your literature you have into specific formats. And now you have viewfind as a tool and there are plenty of other tools in that help like li librarians navigate the space that we could also kind of launch and utilize for this. So it's kind of like depends on specific use case, uh, you know, like what you're looking for. If, if we're talking about programmatic kind of processes, like, okay, here is, we have one example of manually train something. And now I want to like build a like programmatic pipeline that will do something similar to compare it something. I'll probably look into again, elastic search, or again, just kind of building that uh, pipeline, how you you know, query the results because, you know, we have MongoDB cluster, we have Elasticsearch, etc. Probably those components will be better to use for programmatic things. But if we're talking about researchers who kind of like, okay, I don't want to touch code, I just want to play with the results itself just to compare visually, etc. Then it's probably viewfind will be that thing that we will need to, on top of the programmatic pipeline to do this automated generation of, of something, then we'll find a way how to convert it to Mark 21 format. And this is kind of specific standard for, 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 for like how to package literature. And then we could use viewfind or there are some other tools that we could explore as well that could be better suitable for this specific use case. But again, so we will need to do programmatically, Mark 21, you find it's already up and running, and then you can kind of, I guess, more of a front end friendly type of scenario observe, okay, is it easier to find the results I want, you know, with a manual graph or with this one? But the question is, okay, how we get to the standard that that tool is using? Okay, I, I think we, we, we could discuss it. Separately. Yeah, so right. pin, pin on Slack and we could talk about uh, Okay, that. okay. Uh, and second question about uh, uh, how do you uh, collect ideas of uh, infrastructure, uh, of uh, development infrastructure? How, uh, how, how do, you, do you make decision of, okay, let's uh, do this thing or those things uh do, do you mean in terms of whatever services we want to launch or something yeah yeah uh the thing is like there are not like it's very straightforward process if somebody wants to launch something for example you mentioned that you have uh like, inception you, inception like yet another tool so the way it works we're simply trying to launch it first in the labs environment so it means just to figure out like what needs to be done Ideally, whatever we have in production, it, it's already packaged into Docker container and we will launch it in a Docker container. This is how our like kind of staging server is, is uh, tweaked to be done there. And since you can pretty much package anything into containers, so there are like no gatekeeping in terms of what we want to launch. Um, uh, now, like, how the actual process of this works is very simple. Again, you can pin me, you can pin Slava, uh, Maxim, like again, a lot of people over there. Historically, the way process worked is like Maxim is like our guru of containers and he he's like the right guy. So for example, if you have 
some tool that you want to put on a server and let's say you already played in the on our labs vm and you launch it and it requires python install something like you know like all of this crazy commands or something that you kind of get in lost at some point then this is the right point of kind of like maxim we need some help to package this and maxim will just simply fit, like again go through the same process what needs to be done but then he he knows how to package it into docker container so that afterwards okay anybody could just docker compose up you know that compose file and boom your service is running so for example like decano uh, another tool for annotations was kind of started the same way like oh it's it's kind of a setup process to to, to set up it on a server then maxim did it like made it uh, so the kind of already had containers, but it wasn't like really suitable for launching on AWS. So Maxim did a couple of tweaks, those updates, he actually made a pull request to original Decano team. Uh, they are, it's already upstream merged. And in fact, like whatever we have for our Decano instance, other people outside of Corona Y could use as well. So the whole Decano community could use this. So it just kind of like this, the process moves that way, very simple. So. We're trying to, to launch it. If find some roadblocks, you know, in terms of you doing this yourself or you need some help, again, we have the right people within community. You just, you know, voice that, that need kind of like, okay, guys, I want to launch this. I'm running into issues, for example, like on you. So you mentioned that you already doing it, trying, trying or already launched it on your GCP or something. So, we, we just replicate the same process on labs or you can do it yourself because I think you already have access, right? So you can do that one. If, again, run into any roadblocks, you pin Slava, me, Maxim, or maybe again, Pranjalavik. We have again, we have like this, a lot of people who are kind of part of the infrastructure team at the moment, but we don't have exactly a structure for it. It's just a group of people. <laughs> um, and. Then we eventually so, will so, 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 it and run it on Kubernetes eventually when, when we need like really high loads for everything. So, do, do you have something like a backlog of the services? Um, we have, yes. Uh, it just, it's more of a like not a backlog, more of a priority queue because it's kind of like, again, it's like five things we probably want to, it's not like launched here or something. It's mostly kind of like okay, what people actually need and so on. So if if you need like this, just tell us, I really need it. Okay. Like <laughs> then, and then we kind of like, hmm, you know what? Maybe this is not, so we'll just move things around. So we're again, not, we're not in the process of like, you know, like this queue, you know, long queue, queue to do this. It's just simply like, okay, we're trying to anticipate a little bit what people wanted to use. And this is what we did with the Kano hypothesis, etc. But it turns out like after people tried, for example, I know you tried the Kana, it's just kind of like, oh, that's not exactly what we're looking for. And we're kind of yeah, like, right. damn it, we spent so much time to package it into <laughs> formation, etc. But, you know, I mean, but we have it like we have like really state of the art the Kana rollout instant. But otherwise, we're driven by necessity more. So the moment somebody tells, okay, we need this one, we'll prioritize it. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, I think that's good. Um, good to hear about that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Bianca, you kind of are on HR or community engagement or one of those areas, right? Yeah, an increasing amount of areas. Um, but Alex said you was a really good point and Anton was already saying it. You're still looking for good ways to uh, shed some lights on everything that's happening, what's happening in different projects, how to share that with everybody, not just internally, but also externally. So um, some, some work has happened there and some information gathering has happened there. Um, and then, um, still the work on the uh, community engagement. We still have new people joining and we still don't really have a good way to send them into the right direction. Although I think with the numbers now, uh, typically when people introduce themselves, somebody 
response to them and hopefully they end up in a project that they want to contribute to. Um, but what we still don't have is an automated way to get new people registering into, into the CRM. So that's still kind of quite high up on my list to figure out how to do. But we seem to have a shortage on uh, classic developers, I guess I'll call it. Somebody who's wanting to write a script for that. Um, so that's been happening on the community engagement side. And um, otherwise, yeah, uh, the literature review tool project, I also can't completely speak to, but I know um, there was hopefully a, somebody to coordinate that team starting soon. And we had a fantastic conversation with um, Andre, who is an epidemiologist and uh, working out the use cases that will inform how the front end, how the actual interface will be designed um, and still keeping our fingers crossed for potentially getting some funding for building this project out and um, yeah, pushing it, pushing it forward as quickly as possible. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, I did see Pranjal asked, uh, do you know, is the number of people joining decreasing or, uh, or the number steady, like in terms of number of new people joining? Um, I'm not on top of that. I was just judging when, what I was seeing myself in Slack. So you can, you can see that as well when people are coming in to introduce themselves. Um, and so it's, it's good to see there's still people, people joining and wanting, wanting to contribute. Um, and some really interesting people like Andre came came last week and he's been building a uh, search tool for publications that's quite similar to what we're wanting to do with the literature review tool, but he is lacking the data science AI part. So that was a great match. And so it, it just shows that we really need to do more on the external communication, reaching out to organizations, telling people more about all the stuff that's happening at Corona Y. And um, and then we we can make these great connections, and um, and have uh, yeah more people coming to join and work with us. Okay, yeah, I mean it might be good to find a way to like quantify the like numbers of people coming and and going. Uh, I know we already kind of do that, but uh, well, the Slack measure is kind of the m numbers decreasing, but mm. we did like logged all that data on the we could like you know, actually draw out the percentage like differences. Yeah, I mean, another another piece of work on it is to link up the CRM to email so we can also send out some updates via that to specific groups of people to so see if we can re-engage some people who maybe joined in back in March and April and then um, got busy with something else but might want to come back. Um, so there's, there's still a bit of work that can be done on um, re-engagement for people who aren't necessarily on Slack, but also haven't completely dropped out. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point because, yeah, at least from what I've seen, like, we've been still, like, kind of slowly tailing off somewhat in terms of activity. So it'd be good to re-engage people. And, I mean, we, we have over, like, I think 1,000 people on the Slack, but we only have, like, 70 or so active at the most and uh probably yeah, like it's a lot to ask for for people to to check in there and keep track via slack so it's really this this communication piece in like a condensed way communicating what's happening and also doing this for for different groups you know like this the, the medical science people they want to know probably different bits than uh, technical people and so if we can have that information ready for them, then we can specifically reach out and say what what the projects need uh, in terms of their help at the moment. So that's that's kind of where I'd like to go with that. But bits and pieces are still missing, but um, shouldn't be too far up to be able to do that. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm definitely trying to re-engage a couple people on my own team. So uh, yeah, if you have any good advice on how to do that. Um, I would. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, my assumption that I want to try out is if it's specific information, here is what we have, this is the status, here is the specific help that we need, 
and it's kind of bite size because you know it's people are are less free now than they might have been back in in March and April. But if it's very specific asks and something that can be done in a in a couple of hours, then I'm hoping that that might work to get some people back in, and and make it quite clear how they can continue to contribute without it being necessarily very time consuming. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Um, Actually, Anton, um, if you if you're still there. Um, I've been meaning to ask you about the connecting the CRM up to mail. Mm. I tried it, and I think it doesn't work because it's on labs at the moment, and so it doesn't allow connecting to like the email service. Uh, okay, so let's probably talk offline because it's more of a detail. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'll be worrying. Yeah, it's just one. actually just I forgot about it. So <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, 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 that's good. Yeah, exactly. Um, because then we can very easily search for specific groups of people um, from the CRM and and send an email right from there, and that would make uh, mm -hmm. things quite easy if we have very specific asks. Yeah. So I like go back to question regarding uh, people asking like activity on Slack. I just posted it on the general channel the screenshots from like analytics. So in a sense, like our activity numbers are like really stable for the last month actually for the last like two months or something so we had a really crazy peak early on when you know people who were joined for a while early on like remember the wild west time but then we kind of like uh, i guess get to the stable uh, type of situation and since we haven't actually did any PR or kind of like this growth hacking strategies for like, again, initially there was like this, oh, we're doing this, please join us, etc. Right now, again, we have much better like website, everything is much better, join the fight, etc. But since we're not really actively pursuing this, we just simply, the goal right now for us as a community, just kind of, okay, what's the point of adding another like thousand people, for example, right? We're not a, like exactly like this startup that we need to grow to to get something like funding or anything. What we need is actually find the right way how to present what we're already doing and what we already have done. And it doesn't really require new new members. But after we're done with that step, then we have something to show. And I think that will be a great growth hacking like like this base for us to to launch into stratosphere in terms of numbers but for now i think we're good uh the in terms of again so activity you can again just check the screenshot it's like we have uh like 180 160 180 and it's like just fluctuates from from day to day um then if you look another one it's a screenshot of like where messages are sent and I think this is what was like, there was at some point there was a huge change when people kind of already worked with somebody within some gen, gen, general channels or private channels. Then they just simply start pinning each other in direct messages. And I think it's just the culture of coronavirus at this moment. It's like 75. So at some point it was like 75% of direct messages and public channels, 20%. And then we had this uh, uh still small channels like five percent but currently if you look for the last couple of days it's 90 percent plus of direct messages so that's why you know it's hard to see activity on slack um so i don't know like do we want to change this do we want to encourage people to discuss uh, stuff in, in in public channels or not it's just again question of culture i don't know how to uh like force people like oh don't do direct messages please do in channels like i don't know like what do you guys think i don't i don't think we need to but this actually doing these calls the the bi-weekly updates should be a great start mm -hmm. um and maybe encouraging people to share you know milestones or results a little bit more in the public channel but yeah. the communicate the way they want to communicate right yeah, I mean, I yeah, I think that's a good way. I think organizing these calls are a good way to do that. I do think it's slowly been dropping off. Like, I mean, in over June, May and early June, I still think we had 
slightly higher numbers. And I think some of the people were, who are like leaving now, I've been like core people. So it's been like harder because then those are people who've obviously been here longer. So it leaves a bigger hole, at least I've seen. But, uh, but yeah, there does seem to be, uh, you know, somewhat, we're not, we're not, you're like hemorrhaging people fast, but I have noticed like a couple core people have been leaving recently. Actually, um, like uh, so Isaac, what, what you're talking about, I observe this all, also like a lot. Usually people, especially active people, they have like this bursts of activity. Then they, so they contribute something. Usually it's like this. Uh, it's a short term task on the overall of schemes, but it's kind of more of a longer than just simply like some small task to do, right? So they kind of want to do this epic or like sprint, but then after that point, they usually go back to their like real life, you know, and just kind of do something there. And then usually two, three weeks and people come back and re-engage again because they kind of like want another, I guess, dopamine hit from what we do here. So we definitely have this, I think we we're able to find some formula to hook people. So like, I mean, some people are definitely kind of just drift off and they disappear. But for a lot of people who are active like this week, for example, I know three or four people that were like active like two months ago, then they disappear. And then right now they, they back in action. And we, we go back to this really important question. Like, so how do we highlight what we do? And the goal is what? For people who are re-engaging or joining just to see, okay, so uh, like how, how me to be impactful like today and not spending two, three days navigating Slack channels, discussions, videos, just for me to find what, what my next sprint or epic would be for Corona Y. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I have the same feeling about situation. Yeah, there are uh, many people that would like to contribute, but they uh, cannot spend a lot of time trying to understand what should be done and how should be done. So, yeah, th this is very important to to present uh, goals, roadmaps, what we are working on what we trying to achieve. Yeah, actually, Alexey, I would like to highlight your amazing like abilities to to do those bullet points because I'm I'm, I'm following the immunology channel, and after you start doing those like bullet points like summaries after each call, I was able like okay, I don't need to spend time you know getting like under the call, like listening to what people are discussing, because again, my goal is just to simply see what needs to be done right on technical side of things. But at the same time, for me, just kind of like reading that summary, and, and usually there is some follow up discussion a little bit. What I like about the monology channel is just like this kind of structure activity. And it's kind of like this, it, it works as a clock. You kind of know, okay, the guys from my end, right, the guys had a call. Then there is a summary Alexei is doing. Then I definitely know there'll be some discussion. Then I definitely will see like Siddhartha posting something or Nicholas or, you know, some, some other discussions. And you can kind of like see this history of how everything is uh, progressed. And I would love to see this kind of multiplied for other teams, etc. But again, I, I'm, I'm yet to discover this this great way of how to cross-pollinate this, this, this format uh, to other people. But anyways, it's great work you guys do there. Thank you, thank you, Anton. This is one I, it was an idea <laughs> to, yeah. be, because we, ha we have uh, many people involved, but we have just a few people that are very active. So yeah, we need some way to to provide understanding to provide uh, our progress. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that sounds good. Oh, I guess I should briefly say something just to, uh, I think most people are familiar, but uh, 
yeah, I'm, I'm the task time series, uh, the task, yes, kind of lead. So uh, what we're working on is we're, um, yeah, we're making models to basically forecast uh, coronavirus spread at the county level and uh, to help gauge the causal impacts of various interventions. So um, that, that's our main product. Uh, then more generally, we're working on kind of studying uh, various forms of pre-training on time series data to see if we can have positive transfer. And we're researching general architectures that kind of integrate metadata and uh, temporal data because those could be useful for a variety of forecasting tasks, um, not just COVID, but like, you know, uh, forecast hurricanes, forecasting river flows, um, forecasting production, uh, you know, production in different factories and stuff like that. Um, though, though our primary product is obviously COVID related. So um, yeah, with that, we, we've kind of made, we have made a lot of progress on our main repository. We now have interpretability, um, uh, you know, various forms of metrics added. Um, uh, so, um, oh, also add the other main thing we're working on is a general time series forecasting repo that anyone can use for any time series forecasting use case. So the idea is it will contain all the recent um, deep learning for time series forecasting models and easy instructions on how to run, you know, a full search of different architectures to get the best results on any time series task you might have. Um, and then that, you know, in turn helps us on our COVID research because then we can easily, very easily search different architectures and see which work for uh, best for focusing on COVID and which pre-training on different related data sets yield the most improvement um, when forecasting COVID spread at the county level. Um, so, uh, and then we're also working, as I said, on causal factors. So like, what's the causation uh, of, of these events? So like, is it mobility in parks? Is it mobility in bars and restaurants? And you know, what, what specific policy interventions can help? Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of our, our main thing. Um, uh, you know, for a while, as I was saying, we had a pretty active team, around 10 or 12 contributing members. We're down a little bit now to probably only like five or so. Um, and but but we're still, you know, um, moving along and working. We're working right now to improve our models and make them robust to out of distribution events. That's our primary thing. So it can better model, you know, when coming out of lockdown, even though it hasn't seen data from when, you know, we were out of lockdown, it can still model the disease spread well. So that's our main target now. Um, along with connecting with CDC officials um, to get, you know, to, to actually um, do impactful work to help counties plan. Um, and, and yeah, we're also in need of an epidemiologist. We've had a couple come and go, but uh, we're hopefully going to work with them, <laughs> find one that can we can really keep around uh, for a while. So, yeah, that's the brief summary of our group. I mean, what... what, what 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 kind of uh, data do you use in your so models? So we use uh, data from about coronavirus, um, the number like number of new cases, um, weather data, deaths, hospitalizations, mobility data. So like um, a number of groups are offering anonymized mobility data uh, from epidemiology. Yep. Yeah. Epidemiology data, right? Um, what, what exactly were you asking? Uh, uh, this is uh, epidemiology uh, data, right? Yeah, so yeah, d yeah, that, d that about disease spread, demographics, mobility. So yeah, all those kinds of data goes into our models when forecasting. And the goal is to uh, predict uh, number of uh, new cases and stuff like this right so yeah the the main goal is to forecast like n days out the number of cases the number of new cases on each day um either as a rolling average um because there's a lot of reporting inconsistencies so it, it's not that useful to actually report the raw numbers 
Uh, but yeah, to forecast, you know, like uh, next, you know, Tuesday, there'll be, we predict there'll be a rolling average of like 100 new cases in this county or and 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 or hospitalization. So we're, we, we do some research is in some ways uh, predicting hospitalizations is more valuable because then people can better plan if they need to set up, like, say, a field hospital or uh, if they're going to exceed their ICU capacity. So, yeah, those are the main things we look at. And what metrics uh, do, do you use? Uh, so primarily we use things like, um, right now we're using root mean squared error um, and evaluate as our primary metric um, for evaluation. But we also just look at, you know, if our curves match the, you know, the the, cur the actual curve of cases um, or, or hospitalizations. But in terms of the actual metric, yeah, it's mainly root mean squared error. Um, we've experimented with a couple of our metrics too, but we're mainly using that in in conjunction with kind of this qualitative evaluation of kind of like the curve matching and having, well, at least when we had an epi, he'd also look at our features and what features our model was looking at. Have you compared uh, your model with uh, other models? How good it is? Um, so we haven't compared that much directly. Actually, a lot of the common epi mo models are right now running at the state level, um, and they're actually not reporting things in terms of mean squared error. So part of actually one of our tasks is to take some of the like other people's epi models and run them on similar time frames of data and then report the mean squared error. Um, so we get a more direct comparison. But uh, but yeah, a lot of the modeling is going on is actually at the state or region level. So we offer kind of the benefit of added granularity, but that also makes it harder to directly compare, but that is something we're aiming to do. Okay, this is very interesting to, to, to compare different models mm -hmm. because yeah, there are many different models. Yeah, yeah, there, there definitely are, and uh, but yeah, we think that yeah, obviously our main goal is to show how like you know machine learning and the modern techniques work well in in kind of an epi setting, um, and we're actually even working on some hybrid models too because we think like if we combine like the SEER with machine learning, um, it might outperform both because that will make it more robust to handle out of distribution events, whereas the ML will then actually learn from the real data. So um, those are all things that were, are in our backlog and um, currently working on. As far as I can understand this, uh, models uh, often uh, uh, provide option to uh, forecast uh, different uh, scenarios, positive, negative, what if we do this uh, intervention or those intervention, what we will get. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we definitely aim to add simulations to our miles and also just to our repo um, in general, because, you know, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people obviously want to know just not, you know, this is the forecast, let's prepare, but if we take this policy intervention, um, how will it affect the outcome? So, um, yeah, we've also looked at some aspects of causal learning um, and uh, various forms of that to really be able to better determine causation and, and simulate different scenarios like you were mentioning. And, and and what do you use for casual discovery? Um, so right now we we actually talked with one of the offers at ICML. They'd create a kind of causal factor model RNN. Um, so so we're looking at that. RNN. Um, RNN RNN model for casual discovery. Yeah, the, they had a paper. Um, it was mainly yeah an RNN for time series. Um, of uh, basically to look at causation um so that so we might look at that too um we that actually requires setting up a separate model than gen, the general forecast one because the model learns the exact causations over 
time. Um, but yeah, besides that, we've also just looked at the interpretability features and like what our model is attending to um, and stuff. So that's been our primary method so far, but we're looking to integrate more of that like causal, um, specific causal models as well. Great, great. Okay, um, so I think, yeah, that covers all of our stuff for teams here today. Um, yeah, so uh, I think with the idea of these, which we we're going to do them twice a week, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, the idea was Tuesday, th Thursday in a different time, so people from different time zones can join them. Um, so hopefully on Thursday we can uh, also send out an invite beforehand so more people hear about it. But uh, thanks, Isaac, for taking the lead on this today and running it. I think that was very useful. Yeah, sure, no problem. And yeah, we should try to see if uh, yeah people might want to demo stuff. Um, yeah. Like do an actual demo. Um, we do have some stuff on Task TS we could demo, or I don't know, maybe Alexi, do you have anything you might want to demo? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, but, but, uh, frankly, we have uh, uh, only one meeting per a week, weekly meeting. So I, <laughs> I'm not sure that I could present uh, new things twice a week. <laughs> no, no, okay. the idea is not twice a week. The idea is every time, every time I have a meeting, somebody else presents that there's something to demo. Uh, to use this IWD meeting to just showcase what's happening. Okay. okay. Okay, that sounds good. At some point, yeah, I think too, we should probably come out with an exact list of like what teams are still active and doing stuff because there are lots of teams I think have died and there are other teams though that have been created. So um, um, that could be useful, but uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, for now, um, yeah, I think th these meetings are a good way. And um, yeah, anyone have anything else to add? All good. No. Okay, um, so this will save automatically to Google Drive. Uh, I can then send like one of you the file and you can upload it to probably the official Corona Y YouTube because I don't actually have access to that. But uh, but yeah, just tell me who to send it to and I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think Tyler can do it maybe. Okay, I'll, I'll send you the video though, then. Okay. Cool. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Miss. Okay. Bye. Bye.